I don't know what the microphone is. Thank you all, by the way. I'm just very privileged to be here. Yes, sir. The question was, can the discipleship program be used as a litmus test for whether people who are, are ready or not for certain aspects of the ministry? Uh, I think I'm, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on what the program is and who you're talking about. Um, these are spiritual things. They're discerning spiritually and the leaders of God has given to the church. Uh, it was he who gave the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, the equipped body of Christ for what you serve. To bring everyone in mature adulthood and to be all grow in the life of Christ. He who is the head of Christ. God has given people to the church and it's for them to discern whether a person needs a program or not and when that person is ready or not for certain aspects of the ministry. If they're an outsider in terms of they're not committed to the body of Christ, I would say that you're, you're asking for some challenges if you bring them into aspects of the ministry um, that have influence. Um, but I think in general, they're outsiders. They, they're probably not on board with their vision, first of all. And I think, if you look at the order, if you go to the review, the six deputies, there, there is a sense in the order of like place is, that is not necessarily biblical, but I believe is important. You know, from their understanding of the Bible and the scripture and theology, there should be a formation of their spirit and their spiritual life and relationships, especially within the family of Christ, that help shape their mission. And when they agree on all those things, I think you already know that they're qualified for certain aspects of them. But if they don't agree, you know, and have the relationships that seem to you know, be where, especially where Baptist church is here mostly, but the body of Christ is moving through the body, but the spirit is moving through the body of Christ. The people should be able to affirm, especially the leaders, that the Holy Spirit has called this person to the But that, I know that doesn't perfectly answer your question, because I'm saying it depends. Has to pass. I think churches should be able to 
carefully distinguish between the attacker and the leader. Because if you're going to be a leader, you have an instrument for the church. And you don't want to allow the, the leader of the church to be the church in the direction where the church is not going. Thank you. I would not disagree with, with any of those comments. Uh, just listening to you, it looks like you grew up in comfort and security. Uh, my question is, uh, with the, the generations uh, following us, uh, did you ever consider uh, the concept of being poor? Have you been exposed to what is poor and how does this affect the family and ministry? Yeah, uh, the question was whether I had considered or whether young folks are considering poverty and how that shapes ministry. Um, I, I think it's an important and very good question. I can only speak for myself. I wouldn't say that I've gone through the hardest times in the world. And the Lord has brought us to struggle. Keep in mind that you know, we're a pastor's family and we are uh, have moved several times in the life of the ministry in church planting. And so where when we moved from Toronto where my mother was a nurse to Chicago, the support total for our family as a church planting family, with three young kids at home, was $500. Um, we bought all of our clothes uh, for free from giveaways and secondhand shops. And my parents often prayed for milk and food to show up on the table. And so, yet, I wouldn't say that my life has been hard because that was something that God somehow used uh, to make us appreciate. I, I think one of the best ways we can do this is to understand how uh, young folks need to see the world. If, if I hadn't been to the Philippines five times, I would have no idea. If I hadn't been exposed to uh, the south side of Chicago, I would have no idea. Uh, but at the same time, for my parents to also help me understand that you know, it's all by God's grace. You know, we are not where we used to be. It's all by God's grace. It's not by my parents' merits. It's not by you know how hard we worked and even in my life. There are no guarantees. My brother, who is probably a better pastor than I, that one kid, his wife is pregnant with the second on the way, and yet he will maybe never do ministry in the whole kingdom. And we dealt as a family with the division, the hardship, and the financial emergencies, and his life was being was on the line for six months. Constantly the post-traumatic stress of knowing that he might die anytime. That is my bond to my older diseased or struggling handicapped members of the church is that part of being human is suffering. But to compare suffering will get us not very far. I think we can expose one another to hardship and appreciate but we shouldn't use sacrifices that we've made as a way of determining who has earned because it's all by the grace of God. But I appreciate that. I think mission trips, even urban missions, are very, very helpful. And I think the spiritual gap can be met with bringing old and young together in service and prayer and worship. And when I hear, when, when I was 21, I brought a father who was just from the Philippines and the family had no money to the Department of Motor Vehicles for him to take his, his driver's test. And he prayed in the car. And he cried out to the Lord, said, Lord, help me to pass my driver's exam so I can find a job and support my family. That taught me that. Even though I was much younger than him, and that was not my experience, it was a moment of prayer and the Holy Spirit used to bridge me.
but in Jamaican culture, as I mentioned before, it's like the kids, they want the kids, when you get to a point, you graduate from college or you graduate, the one the family want to get out of the house. So then when I was Filipinos, uh, they tell me, no, 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 the kid's going to stay. They're going to stay. They're going to stay. They'll <laughs> take, take, take care of me when I get older. You know, so it was more like a shock. That's like you mentioned a cultural shock. That was one of the biggest shocks. And I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. But, you know, this is something that, but anyway, Jamaica was a British colony, so maybe, you know, I don't know. How we expand on that? Yeah. So we're glad you're doing the family. Great job, folks in that church, to practice adoption well. Um, yeah, that's good. We should talk about that. Yeah. Before we moved from Toronto, the church my father pastored was Commonwealth Avenue Baptist Church in Toronto, and uh, it was Jamaican immigrants, Scottish retirees, and Filipino immigrants. Uh, that was really. I think that. Uh, kind of an academic thing for me to say, but those of us who come from backgrounds that have been colonized several times, Brazilian, Puerto Rican, Jamaican, you know, Filipino, it's hard. And I think your children will bear the brunt of it because for you coming from that place, you can say, I'm Filipino. And you have a sense of what that means. But for your kids, their friends sit around and talk and say, what about you? What are you? Because I'm, I'm a person, first of all, I'm a child of God. No, no, what are you? They don't mean that. Filipino, what does that mean? Kids born here, they don't know. Because what can they say? But challenging as that is, we become chameleons, right? We're able to mix with anybody. And I think people who come from a background that have been colonized several times have respect. And um, you're able to see from the outside. I love in our church that we have a staff that is diverse. And I think what that has helped us to do right away is to hear, what are the white people in our church? We're not serving or trying to teach them, but we love them, so we want to serve them ministry. And, you know, what are the non filipinos think? What do the senior citizens think? And the fact that we have perspective. Because all of us have blind spots. It enables us to see into more blind spots and say, you know, I didn't think about it. And so I appreciate that. And in the end, we know that the church is changing so much, Filipinos marry anybody, that what do the kids identify as? And so now we have kids, and we don't even know what they are. We look at them and say, they're brown and gray and white and all kinds of things, but they're all gorgeous, loved by, loved by Jesus. And, you know, they're, they're going to feel more the relationships than the culture. That's why that culture piece, as much as we think that that's number one, we're dealing with spiritual things, and the Spirit of God is able to work through all these other aspects and then use the culture. But the culture itself is, is not the first and foremost issue. If anything, I think, among believers, it becomes a great asset. Any other questions, though? Thank you for that. Great job to your free church family. I'll say one last piece, maybe, about that, because I think the church is going to change. And then I'll, I'll do the question. You can hand the microphone to me. But um, if you think of Revelation 7, all the difference that exists in the vision John has of the new heavens and the new earth, where does the difference come from? Ultimately, that's the question we have to ask. If in a situation of redemption and restoration in heaven, God does not make everybody the same, but in heaven they maintain the different tribe and nation and tongue. Somehow, God preserves that. We know then, clearly that God, God loves that. And we know God is using that to reach more people. Yes? Contrast in the church is the uh, disciple or kids so uh, that we grow old, uh, we will not be brought away from God. The other Sunday, there was a Christian from a mother. She was asking because uh, her son 
we start a professor in Italy. So he grew up uh, very active in the church. He had a uh, ministry in the church. And now that uh, since he was in college until he graduated, his mother is wondering why he, she can't see his son anymore in the church. What went wrong to his son? That was it. I think one of the worst things I could do is give you a new secret. I don't know them. I don't know anything about their life. So I can't simply say what they I can say that in these gaps, the one that might surprise some of us the most is number two. Because we think, isn't it that if I download to them the information and I teach them the, 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 the Baptist distinctives, that they will automatically come out as disciples? That's the thought. And here's what's happening. As a first generation, often we're thinking, because that's how I learn. But the issue is, if you grew up in the Philippines, where you have 80%, 85% Catholics, the rest are almost Protestants or in a cult. Almost everybody has a Judeo-Christian framework. So you're dealing with people you can assume have a sense of God, of heaven and hell, of sin, of Jesus, and of the Bible, and many other things. Here, you're dealing with people around our kids who have different religions. Maybe they don't even believe in sin. How do we preach to people who don't believe in sin? And so I can't tell you exactly what went wrong, but I know it's not enough to teach Bible and theology. Number one, it's the work of God and His Spirit. It's not up to us. So I don't know what to say to solve the problem. But two, the spiritual life is the anchor. It's not about becoming biblical theologians and earning degrees. Jesus said, even if the faith is as small as a mustard seed, it's not the size of the faith, it's the strength of that little thing. So it's not how much Bible and theology we know, although that's important, but it's, it's an anchored spiritually. And I think that even as pastors, you know, the average pastor stays in the church four years. So hats off to all our pastors who stay longer. My, my parents, they've stayed in every church, you know, 20 years. Um, the average pastor stays four years, and one of the reasons for such burnout and conflict and moral failure is they know all the right stuff, but it hasn't reshaped their hearts. I, I think the issue most often is that we raise our kids assuming they have a framework like we had when we were in the Philippines, but nowadays it takes so much more uh, spiritual hard work. See, do they, do they know how to fast? Do they know how to pray? Do they understand service? Do they worship together? These are the things that are really the anchor around the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yes, Pastor. Well, one, of the, uh, one of the biggest blunders that we learn in the church is that we bring our kids to church. We grow them in the activities that we have in the church. So what happens is we grow them in the church but we never grow them in Christ. So they were committed in ministerial work, they served the church, they worked in the church, then they go out of the church, but we never really raise them in a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that is what the issue lies. And that is what Pastor James tried to, to convey to us in all those lectures that he has given to us, is that discipleship really starts in the home. No, let's let's go out of the framework that we bring our kids to church. You know, uh, depend on Sunday school for an hour and a half in the church, and we thought that it's going to make a difference in their lives. They're going to start in that home. And every parent, who, especially for those who are starting to have their kids, right, who come to understand that we need to grow our children in Christ. The church is only a support. Activity is only a support. But bringing them in a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus 